<laughs> anyway, um, literally, I t how long has it been since I built this desk? Since the day after I built the desk, it's been covered with crap. I have not touched it. It's been a nice, convenient, flat surface. My lunch bag usually sits here. I'm a terrible person. I knew that was going to happen. I was really trying not to. Hello, and welcome to, um, well, Carlin's Worlds. Yeah, that should work. I'm a wanderer, a tinkerer, sometimes a nomad, a military veteran. I do things differently. There will be tinkering. I have a motorcycle, a truck, and a school bus. I live off-grid, so there will be some solar, batteries, inverters, and maybe even some wind. It blows. And that's all I can fit into about 30 seconds. Oh, and please, if you like any of this, it would be really awesome if you could subscribe and click that notify bell. Drop a comment if you have any questions or ideas. Share, like, comment, subscribe, notify. Oh, and Patreon if you're really an awesome kind of person. Cool. On with the show already. Ironically, since I built the desk, I've done almost everything back on the computer again. What I was hoping to do was to actually do hand-drawn cartooning. Which still might happen in some elements, but... Mostly I suck as an artist, as far as, you know, I'm not, if I, if I try really hard, I actually am getting better, but it hasn't been one of those things where, yeah, I could just sit down and draw something really quickly. So I've kind of shifted gears on that a little bit, and I'm doing most of the building in Lightwave, which is a 3D animation program. The idea there is once you've built the object once, it's like a CAD program, then the object is always right, you know, and in Lightwave, um, it's kind of a kind of a cool program. I'm gonna do a video about that sometime. But you know, if you start off, and then you got your, you know, you got your person here, and the person is wearing a hat, you know. See, I'm not a good artist, you know. Um, for it to be a scene, you need an object and a light and a camera. That's just like real photography. So in Lightwave. gives you a camera and I think it still looks like this it looks like a little movie camera right and then somewhere else you could have a light which could be a point light there's different kinds of lights even and it's a ray tracing program and so Lightwave actually computes how this light would travel and bounce back to the camera and then it draws the picture as if you were taking a picture, right? Which is pretty cool. What's neat about it is if you spend the time and you get your, your characters and your objects and your assets all right, they'll always be right. Um, if you want to do perspective, you know, the object closer will look bigger, the object further away will look smaller. It does it all for you. You can actually change the lenses on the camera to be a fisheye lens or to be a telephoto lens, which gives you a different look. So it's pretty slick. Um, I have gone back and forth on this idea as far as hand drawing, doing it in Lightwave, stop motion animation. I've actually, um, probably from the second day I was writing Mars Clipper. I really wanted to do this as live action, like real actors and stuff like that. And uh, in my apartment in Austin, I actually started building the first spaceship set. And it was pretty obvious right away that that wasn't going to work because there's no way I could pull that off in that amount of space. The other reality that really hit me was with my hours and my way of doing things, it was going to be very difficult to put together any kind of a crew, especially since I didn't have a lot of money. And, you know, telling an actor that you'd like them to work for free, you know, who wants to work for free, even if it's really fun? There are some people that'll do it for a hobby, but then you can't expect them to show up every day if, if you need them to, because you're not paying them. So then I started looking at stop motion animation and there was something I did, oh geez, two or three years ago now, I guess, where I got a GI Joe that was, I believe it was Commander Crippen, Krypton, Crippen, 
the first space shuttle pilot. So it had the helmet, it had the orange flight suit, it was, you know, it was everything. It was really awesome. And so I did a little stop motion of him. And uh, G.I. Joes aren't really good for stop motion because you can't get them to hold the pose very well. But it was a good start. And I really enjoyed the process. But again, you still needed some space to set up your sets. You know, if you're G.I. Joe is, I think, a foot tall, so that's one to six scale. So you had to still build all your sets, and then you had to get your cameras down where they could get the pictures and everything. So when I started thinking about hand drawing, not for animation, but just for cartooning, I was still looking at Lightwave as a possible back end to that. And that's something I, I still am playing around with. So, you know, for example, just... I've used this one a couple of times already. You know, so my thought was if I can make a really good whatever, this is the robot. So if I can make a really good line drawing of the robot and then use that as a background layer and then hand trace it, then the proportions would always be the same. Okay. And then I build another character for, you know, basically me. And then I could draw what the spaceship would look like from the inside. But you don't want it to always be from the same angle, so you'd have to draw a bunch of different variations of it. By doing that in Lightwave, Lightwave is a 3D program. So you create the object as a 3D object. Um, in fact, I've actually have 3D printed objects that I made in Lightwave. You know, so it works really well for that, which does open up a lot of ideas because if I build my robot character in Lightwave, I could then 3D print it. And ironically, you could go full circle and you could take that 3D printed object and go right back into stop motion animation. So there's there's a lot of ideas that kind of bounce around in my head. So that's that. I just wanted to say something that, yes, I, I know I haven't used this as a drawing desk since I built it, but today might be the day. So one of the things that I'm looking at, when I first did this version of dreads, to make things simpler, I just did ball joints um, for each of the joints in the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and so on. And things like car suspension use ball joints. All right, makes it easy. So you can get an object to move in three, three or four, you know, and. <clears throat> in different positions, it's not just a hinge. So if you had a hinge with a pin like that, it can move this way, but that's all. All right. The other idea is if it was an actual ball and then a socket that the ball sits inside of. And then coming off of this and then coming off of this could be, you know, say this is your elbow, okay. The ball would let it move like a hinge, but it could also go this way or this way, so you could have a lot of motion. That's pretty practical in a way, but at the same time, how do you make that move? Right. I don't have a picture of a Terminator robot, which would be pretty cool. I thought about that a little bit. I'm like, okay, so I could kind of do this how they did the Terminators. So, you know, say if your shoulder is here, they had what looked like hydraulic or air actuators in different points. And then if something was over here, you know, maybe we do like that, and then the arm is sticking out, okay. So this is where it pivots from. I could probably do that better even. I started drawing before I had it clear in my head what I was trying to do. Never a good idea. So if you had one here and one here, and these could be symmetrical or whatever. But if this one moves in or out, it moves this piece and then the arm would go up. If this thing moves out, it would push it this way and the arm would go down, something like that. And you don't even need one on either side. You could have the 
is 90 degrees apart. So if your ball is here, you could put one here and one here. This one would push or pull, and this one would push or pull, and that would give you up, down, left, right. And they would just pivot off of the ball joint. Well, the way I drew this, I didn't leave anywhere for the actuators to be. I just drew the balls, you know, so they would pivot, but there would be nothing that would move them. All right. What I'm looking at, though, one, at this stage, it's still going to be a cartoon. Even if I do it as computer 3D animation, initially, it's not going to be animated. I'm just going to do, you know, like a, like a comic book. So, you know, picture, 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 picture. Which, you know, if we do it as, I may still make a video from that on YouTube. So I'll have the first picture as, you know, 20 seconds, and then I could do voices, or I could just have text bubbles appear, and then, you know, maybe the camera would even move to the second picture, and then you kind of do that effect, something like that. Um, initially, I'm not going to actually have, you know, the robot walking across the screen. I can do that, but it takes an enormous amount of time, and that's one thing I right, right now I don't have. Um, also, it takes a lot of electricity, ironically, because for animation to work, the, key, the computer has to make, or however you do your animation, if it's a movie, film, 24 frames a second is typical. Um, most of the TV was about 30 frames a second. Now that we got high def, we can do 60 frames or 100 frames a second. <laughs> So that means you had to draw 100 pictures or 50 or 60 or 24 pictures for every second. That takes a while. And the computer can do that really well because it does what they call tweening. So let's say that you had a like a ball bouncing, you know, so here's your floor and the ball starts here and it comes down and it bounces and it comes up and it slows down and it speeds up and it bounces and eventually it slows down, all right? Well, you can set that up as a math formula, and you just start it. You don't have to sit there and draw every iteration of the ball. The computer just does it for you. So that kind of thing is pretty good. Um, if you're having your robot walk from one side to the other, in animation they have what they call a walking cycle, and so you know that, you know, one foot starts, it goes, it lifts up, it moves forward, it comes down, and then the other one picks up, and then, you know, after a while, it starts over again. Uh, back in the 70s, they were really good about doing that. Um, things like the Flintstones, you know, they just repeated it over and over and over kind of a thing. They didn't bother changing it. Once you got one to work, you just let them keep doing it. In fact, there was always the classic scene of, somebody chasing somebody else through the house and they would run through the living room and then the kitchen and then the living room and the kitchen and the living room and the kitchen and they just get looping that over and over until they had enough time for the dialogue to catch up you know and everybody knew what they were doing it was no big deal so tweening is if you wanted to have the robot start here and then end up here instead of doing every picture separately, you just say, okay, do a walk cycle and start here and end here 10 seconds later. The computer just does it all for you. It figures it out. And if you have a normal walk, as you're going from one foot to the other, you lift up a little bit, and so the head would actually slowly rise and fall and rise and fall as you're walking. And you, once you figure that out, it just does it for you, and that makes it pretty easy. However, it could take maybe, you know, faster, newer computers make a big difference, but it may take one minute to draw each picture. Well, if there's 30 pictures in one second, that one second could take the computer maybe half an hour to draw. So even, you know, as the artist, 
I could be telling it, okay, do this and then do this and then do this. And when I'm done setting up all of the instructions, I hit go, I walk away, I go get lunch, do laundry, whatever, come back and see how it's doing. When it's finished, then I look at it and decide, you know what, when I actually see it happening in real time, I don't like it. Let me change something. So you make a couple changes and then you start over and you do the whole thing again. That's still a hundred times better than the old cell animation, which was called cell because they drew it on cellulite, cellulose, cellophane, clear plastic, one of those. You know, so you could actually have, you know, if, if this was the stuff, you could lay it over and then you could draw something on top of it. And the way that they did it, they would have one person would draw the background and the background wouldn't change, but they could move the background across the, in front of the camera or the background could sit still and you could move your characters across and the background wouldn't change and so you wouldn't draw the background every time you would just draw what changed and then you could have these little pieces of clear plastic cellophane is what it was supposed to be you know so you could draw maybe your walk cycle had 10 different pictures to figure out how the legs moved and so you could have a stack of 10 images, put the first one down, move it a little bit, take the picture, take it off, put the next one on, move it a little bit, take the picture, and like that. Well, if you screwed up in cell animation, you had to redo the entire thing. It was all lost, right? In the computer, I can make the change. It still has to redraw it, but I don't have to sit there and redo it. So we're making progress here. What I'm going to do for today, and I started doing this on the computer, and I just kind of felt like I wanted to see it drawn first before I went into the computer. I, I quite often I just do things on the computer. What I'm thinking, well, a couple things. On dreads, I think what's going to happen is once I've got the design figured out, I'm going to end up with uh, the, the effect of the ball anyway covering the joint because I want a a shell or a bodywork like a fairing kind of covering the joints dreads is supposed to be a helper robot out on the spaceship and as such she needs to be able to do things that i'm doing or to help me do things that i'm doing my character and if i'm out there grinding or drilling you know or welding you know that kind of thing all that metal sh shavings and sparks and everything are going to be, you know, hitting her probably. And if you got a finely uh, machined joint, you don't want to have a bunch of metal shavings falling into it because then it's going to get all messed up. So when we get all done building it, it's going to end up with something over top of it anyway. Which will make my life easier when it comes time for the actual cartoon making because it's easy to do the ball. If I end up drawing parts of this, if I draw it as a ball, and then if the ball is actually a covering for a more complicated joint on the inside, we don't have to draw all this crazy detail. Uh, in fact, the, the version that I'm working on now has much less of this detail visible because it'll be simpler. Right? So what I'm thinking is I'm gonna create a joint, know how it's gonna work, in my mind, I want the joint to look like it could work. When we first saw the Terminator back in, was it 1983, 1984, something like that? When you first saw the Terminator on the movie screen, granted, I didn't really take the time to analyze it at the time, but it looked like it worked. I mean, yeah, it's not likely that in 84 anybody had the ability to make a robot that could walk like that. Now you probably, you know, you can. Like Boston Dynamics, they've got robots that could run faster than people. All right. But not in 84. But what, what made the Terminator look so real is they took the time to draw the actuators that made the arms move. You know, it, it looked like it was made out of, you know, titanium with hydraulics and, and pneumatics and, you know the ability to walk. It wasn't until years later when you got the DVD that you realized that they actually did the, a lot of it was stop motion. You know, the thing couldn't stand up by itself. They had guys holding it. You know, 
it was kind of a letdown, but at the same time, it, they did it so well, especially for 84. There was no computer animation back then. They did it as physical props, which was amazing. So when I'm designing this, I want to be able to say that if I had the time and the money, I could build it and it would actually work. Because now, you know, there's 14-year-old kids that are building robots that can drive around. Or, you know, some of them can probably walk. So I want this to have the ability that if I design it right, it'll be easy to draw, it'll be easy on the computer, but at the same time we could physically build one. That's kind of my goal. So what I was looking at, things like, um, what's the word, like a bearing block. All right. That's the nice thing about the whiteboard is it's really easy to erase. So you get black fingers, but that's okay. That's where it bolts. Yeah, it bolts going down through to, to lock it in place, and then your shaft is here. So if we look at it from the side, your shaft could come through it, through that hole. So that's your shaft. All right. So I'm thinking a couple of bearing blocks up in the shoulder would make sense. Then you're your actuator could be on one side, and this could be something as simple as, I'm probably gonna use something like servos. So, if you're into radio controlled airplanes, you know what I mean. It's got the little servo and the little arm, and then the servo moves, and the push-pull tube comes out, and it makes, you know, if there's a hinge, and a servo arm. So if this part moves back and forth, this moves back and forth, and this causes your ailerons to move up or down on your airplane. All right. So what I'm thinking on the inboard side, you know, in the in the body would be here, and this could be the shoulder. Now, rather than doing a ball joint, what if our shoulder comes out through the bearing block and to get the arm to move forward and backwards we just rotate this thing and then the arm moves you know from straight down back a little bit to forward and this could be you know there could be a motor directly on here there could be a linkage there could be a belt and then a, a bigger motor down below you know, to give it the forward and back, probably a stepper motor or a servo. And the nice thing about doing servos is they have already 180 degree rotation, all right? So, and by changing the length of the arms, you can give it faster movement or more torque. And, you know, or you can get a bigger servo. They're you know they're well developed. They're easy to work with. They're easy you know they're they're made to work with digital signals already. So probably something like a servo. All right. So that would let us move the arm forward and, and backwards. Okay. So the arm could be hanging off of here. Now if I want the arm to extend outward, all I'd have to do is have a pivot up here. And then a secondary push pull here that could move the arm from here out to here. And this whole thing is riding on this bearing block. And the fun thing is, is I used to be an aircraft mechanic. I worked on helicopters and jets in the Navy. And so when I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, so all I'd have to do is have a push-pull tube and mount it on a pivot that's here. And I could have a second servo right next to the first one. And because this thing is moving forward or back, I could even have the servo for the side to side mounted onto this so that it would stay relative, which would make a lot of sense. So maybe we build this with the servo here 
uh, it's got the arm and then it can push it in and out and this servo rides on the whole assembly and you know so maybe one you know maybe you have a really big one that gives you up and down and then you don't need as much power pushing your arms out so once the arm is out it just stays there okay and that's pretty much it if I had two two degrees of motion you know arm forward or back and arm up or down in this direction I think that's all I'd need for the shoulder when I was drawing this I was kind of looking at that and I'm like if you had another actuator up at the top you could actually you know teach it how to shrug its shoulders and everything like that but in the story this is a prototype robot that wasn't even ready to go um, it was it, we kind of like the, the mission changed in the last year before they launched and they said well you know if we have the opportunity to fly why don't we take what we have available with us and on the spaceship we're gonna have basically a machine shop and the fun thing is or the useful thing or whatever the guys back home can design something send us the plans and we can create it on the spaceship so every part of the design can be modified as we go and you know if it's a robot it's software and hardware well it's you know you can up you know your phone and your computer gets regular software updates well there's no reason that we couldn't do an update on the on the software on the robot you know so it, it learns new abilities as they figure them out so in the beginning this might end up being fairly crude and then it eventually evolves into a better design kind of makes it interesting when you look at it from that point of view because then you can change things you're not locked into it some of the robot designs I've seen have used what's essentially like tendons and that can be as simple as um, the cables on your bicycle like your brakes you know so you got you know you got a lever that you pull if you pull it down inside the the lever is where the cable hooks up to that and here's a pivot so you pull it down and it pulls the cable this way and then on the other end of that comes down so when you pull it it pushes this end up and that could be hooked up to your brakes such that when you pull it this pulls up there's a pivot and a pivot and your brakes get pushed in just like that and that's super simple so it would make sense that you could use something like that you could put a servo on one end and you pull the cable Maybe there's a spring, the same as on your bicycle brakes, so there's a spring that pulls it back when you let go to release the brakes. So that could be how your hand works on the robot. You know, so instead of having, you know, servos inside the hand, you put servos way up further up the arm. And every time and this was one of the things that they that made the, the Terminator look so real, is there was scenes where, you know, Schwarzenegger was doing surgery on his arm after he got battle damage and so he's cutting into his arm and inside were all the tubes and he just grabs his pliers and he moves it and gets his finger to work again you know and as a as a teenager when that came out that just blew my mind you know the fact that you know I didn't really comprehend I don't think I mean I understood movie making and effects and makeup and stuff but when, it, when he cuts his arm open and gets his fingers to work that just blew my mind I was like whoa so that was pretty pretty cool for at the time as a cartoon people always have three fingers on cartoons instead of four it gives you the the, the idea that it's a hand but you're not going to take the time to draw all four fingers you know so i'm thinking my character will probably be i think your typical three-fingered cartoon character you know simple thumb finger 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 done you know probably a little bit better than that but not much just to keep it simple right well, if it's a robot, if anybody remember um, Buck Rogers, uh, the TV show, I, I never did see the original comic strips that that was based on, but um, Twinkie, the robot, I think he had just simple pinchers. You know, so like something like that. And that was his arm. And so he, he'd go around, if you want to pick something up, you would just, you know, pinch it, right? 
So that's pretty simple. If this is a robot that would be helping build things, what I'm thinking, and these would be kind of soft surfaces, they wouldn't necessarily be vice grips, but you know, if they had a little bit of a curve in the inside, so whatever was, you know, maybe you'd have a pad that comes off the front, you know, so when you squeeze it, that would grip a little bit, something like that. Another idea that I've been looking at for, for dreads is if we make the wrist joint where the hand is, what if the hand is removable and you could put a different tool there depending on what you're doing? All right. Parts of the, the storyline have us assembling things, which would be, you know, you got like your little cordless impact tool and you're, you're tightening nuts on things, or you're riveting, or um, wiring things and stuff like that. Hooking up wires and making connectors for wires and that kind of thing. So, if it's a day where you're doing stuff with tools, does it make sense for your robot to have a hand and then you give her the tool that she holds and then she pulls the trigger, you know, for the drill? Or why don't we modify a drill that would just, you take off her hand and you mount this tool right to her arm, all right? And then since she's a robot, she doesn't need the trigger to, to start the tool you just connect the wire right to her arm and then she uses the tool as if it's a part of her body. All right, that just makes a lot more sense to me. So what I'm looking at is sort of a Swiss Army knife effect. You know, so if your arm is here, and then your wrist, I'll just draw it as a ball again, and then your hand, your gripper would come out the front This is why I'm not doing any of this hand round. Um, maybe this is a quick disconnect fitting that she could literally just release it and pick up another tool. You know, so her... There's no reason for the pistol grip of the drill, so the drill could be just simply the motor. And out the front of it, is you know the the socket maybe you know so here here she's got a ten millimeter socket and she's tightening nuts down and that would just be part of the arm that kind of a thing and then when you need a different tool one if if it's just a different size you put a different socket on or you remove the whole thing and you put the grippers back on or you know one hand is the gripper and one hand is something else. So that's kind of the, the direction I'm looking. Only better, but some of this in the beginning, like now, you just kind of got to stop and look at it. And I find doing this kind of a, a video really helps me get my head around it sometimes because if I'm doing it as a drawing, it's way too much erasing and, and fixing and, you know, tweaking and stuff like that. And sometimes I just needed to, to stop and think, how would you make different parts work? So I went back and I looked and I'm like, all right, if there was a bearing block in the shoulder, that gives it enough support. And then it's, it's on bearings, the shaft would go through and you'd have freedom of mo motion, motion, freedom of motion. And then by integrating one servo inside another servo, this one gives you one, de one degree, and this one rides inside of it. That just seemed like it made sense. And then shoulders, let's get some of these abominations out of the way here. Shoulders, I think that's basically good enough. If I look at the elbow, one of the things that I'm, I'm looking at is your arm has the ability to move 
basically 180 degrees. Okay, and that does it by rotating the whole arm, the forearm. Well, that's a more complicated than it needs to be, I think. So if this is your bicep, and then your elbow is down here, let's have it going this way, okay, and this can move up or down. What about if right here, just above the elbow, we make this a slip ring? so that the whole bicep can rotate and that would give the arm motion back and forth and then your your elbow is much simpler it only has to be able to pivot in one direction I think that made it a lot simpler in my head and this could be one thing I was looking at he did I wheel or a sprocket and then a littler wheel the motor could turn the little wheel it gives you lots of torque and that turns the big wheel the big wheel pivots and that's, that's this pivot here so you could put a motor inside the bicep that could rotate this whole thing and uh, and I was, I was looking at this this was quite a while ago I came up with this make this the inside of the wheel so instead of it being you know a sprocket with the teeth on the outside okay with the teeth on the inside so then your your small wheel is inside instead of outside so that's a ring gear okay then your motor could be closer to the center line. And that would be here. This is your bicep, your shoulder, and your elbow joint. So this turning could change the position of your arm back and forth. And I th what I'm thinking is, it just makes a lot of sense from, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but if I think about this from an engineering point of view, if you got one of these to work, put the same thing down at the wrist. So now that that's how your, your wrist could rotate. So instead of, it's not gonna have this kind of motion. You know, that's pretty cool, but if the, ro if the rotation could be, you know, maybe simple up and down. So that we do a, sim a simple pin across for a, a pivot and then a joint. But somewhere in the arm, we also have the ability for the whole arm to turn, in addition to the elbow that it can rotate. Sometimes the hard thing is, you look at this, and it's like, well, how did somebody else do this? Because there's no reason to completely reinvent the wheel. You know, if I can use things like the bearing block in a typical radio-controlled servo and stepper motors, because I think a stepper motor in here would make the most sense stepper motors have an enormous amount of torque and they can be driven to a specific point every time and that's what you know between servos and stepper motors that's really how you need your robot to work on the legs by the second one i already was was thinking about this the knee joint is going to be simple one directions it's a it's just a simple pivot Ankles probably a simple pivot, but they also need to be able to roll the foot side to side for balance. And then in the hips, you need two directions there. And I think the hip and the shoulder will be very similar. So it's got forward and back for walking, but you also need some of the side to side for balance. And I think if I can duplicate the same idea from the shoulder to the hip, It'll probably be bigger, but it'll be the same basic joint. But day to day, you're not going to see most of the mechanism. So for me, though, it's, I guess it's important to me because I wanted to, from the beginning, I've always thought this would be a cool thing if I could actually build it and make it work. I need to know how it would work on the inside. Never see it day to day you're not going to see all of this stuff 
you're only going to see the bodywork. One last thing that I, I kind of had this epiphany just a week or two ago. Even though I'm trying to get some realism into the robot's design, it's still always going to be a, basically a comic strip. And the more I thought about that, I'm like, all right, so it doesn't have to be perfect, right? And then I got to thinking about it, and part of this, you know, when I was, man, a couple of years ago already, I was going down a path of trying to make it really realistic. And then I kind of backed up a second, and I thought about it, and I'm like, well, there's a phrase from robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, they call it the un, they call it the uncanny valley, and the idea is, and this comes from like you know way way back you know thousands of years ago kind of a thing. For our entire history, we've been very good at recognizing a, a fake. And if you hold up a teddy bear, you know it's not real, or a doll, or whatever. So your brain says, "Okay, it's a toy. It's not a big. It's not a threat. It's not, you know, it's not a. It's not trying to fool me. It's it's to be funny, you know." So you look at a cartoon or something like that. If something becomes too real, all of a sudden, the closer it gets to reality, the more uncomfortable you feel because you're not really sure what, what the problem is. You look at it like, okay, something's not right because we're so good at, at spotting a fake. So if something is just not quite right, um, there's been a lot of studies done on this and if it's too close to reality, it becomes very uncomfortable, I guess. And that's when the, what they call the uncanny valley. And um, you can look it up. There's a bunch of uh, information on this. But if you start off with like a stick figure, okay, that's not, you know, you look at it, okay, it's supposed to represent a person, it's an icon, but it's not very realistic. Um, well, even with this, you know, when I was, when I did this, this, I had no reference. I just sketched it out one afternoon. Um, I think it was probably only about this tall when I sketched it. You know, this has been enlarged and photocopied a few times. So it was just kind of fun. This one I drew looking at a reference and trying to get the proportions more right. The head is still too big. Um, I felt that the proportions on this were closer to human, but it didn't seem, I didn't like it as much. I realized that I liked just the basic proportions of this because it was less human. When you tried to make it more human, then it got really weird. So I kind of looked at that for a while. I'm like, all right, back off on, you know, trying to make it real. The real revelation, though, was when I started trying to make my own character, because I know what I look like, and I didn't really want it to be too much like me. As a starting point, um, it's easier if you have a picture of what you're working on. And in, in Lightwave, in the 3D program, you can put the pictures on the screen as a background and then you can kind of draw your object in front of the pictures so that your proportions are always right. And even though I knew it was basically right, it just didn't look good. You know, and I'm like, okay, maybe that's because it looks like me. <laughs> you know, that's like, ah, uh, that's the last thing we need is another one of me out there. But I'm like, all right, so if I, if I gave myself the freedom to make it less reality, you know, it's always good to have a stack of clean whiteboards at this stage. So, and I'm not going to get all crazy on this, but I'm thinking, okay, so if, you know, if I figured my person was supposed to be like, you know, shoulders and, you know, like that, and arms, and, you know, the body, yeah, I suck at this. So if your body and your waist and you got legs, okay, right here. Good enough. You get the idea. Right? Okay. Well, you think about all your cartoons, you know, um, peanuts. 
good example. I don't have any pictures of peanuts out here, but heads are always too big. You know, uh, they don't draw them looking very athletic. You know, he's probably got a little bit too much of a belly. Legs seem way too short, typically. Um, arms, you know, whatever. And then you always got the same shirt on. You got your stripes or whatever. And then your hands are too big because, and this comes from Da Vinci or Michelangelo? Who did the Who did the David? Anyway, you know what I mean, right? This came from art class. You look at it and you're like, okay, it's an awesome sculpture, but most people don't catch the fact that the head and the hands on the David are pr pr proportionately too big, and that was done on purpose. You know, because that's that's what you see is you know what does the you know the thinking and the doing the head and the hands. So he made them a little bit too big. It's not grotesquely too big, but in a in a comic, in a cartoon, or in an animation. It's if, if if it's doing story dialogue driven, you know, if you're if you're trying to tell your story, you're gonna have dialogue and you're gonna have expressions. So making the head and th making the head too big is a good idea. So you have more room for your eyes, you know, to do whatever. Draw your googly eyes, right? Um, a lot of cartoons don't have noses or very simple noses, so don't try to get all crazy making a hyper detailed nose. You know. So the more I thought about it, I'm like, yeah, you know what, it just makes more sense. Oh, and then since the spacesuit is a huge part of this, you know, this giant helmet on top, right? It's just gonna look freaking hilarious. So I'm like, well, that's just way more fun than trying to do it super accurate. And then down the line, and this is one of the things that was tripping me up because I always wanted to have the option if, you know, Disney or somebody decides, oh my God, that's a cool story. Here's here's a million dollars. We'd like to buy it. Or Pixar. I'd be like, woo, you know, sold. I'd sell out in a, sec in a second, you know. But I was like, man, if I can get my design right, then when we come back to Dreads, it's got the proportions right, and we could find an actor or an actress that could fit inside the suit. You know, if I end up with something goofy like this, or if my robot ends up being three and a half feet tall, you know, then you got to find, you know, somebody that fits into that. But if your robot is five feet tall, it's a lot more likely you can find somebody that can wear the suit. And then I was like, okay, so now I got to, you know, at that point I was like, man, I got to figure out how to draw this in a way that a person would look right inside of it. I mean, C-3PO, there was a guy that wore the suit, right? And in fact, as far as I know, I'm pretty sure that they had the same guy every, in every movie to wear the C-3PO suit, right? So, even though it looked like a robot, there was actually somebody inside of it all the time. So, if I go into this kind of territory, this will be more fun. But, you know, in reality, you know, the idea of somebody, you know, coming up and waving money at me and wanting to buy the rights to my story so they can make a movie, that's, that's the least of my concerns right now. So, I'm not going to worry about that too much. But the more I go in this direction, the more fun it seemed to be. The more I tried to do it, you know, I'm not going to call this reality, um, the less fun it was because you're trying to take it too seriously. So um, some of the elements that I'm working into it already, on dreads, she's got Wi-Fi antennas. Now, on a spaceship, you don't need antennas on your on your robot because the whole spaceship is so small you could have Wi-Fi repeaters in every part of the spaceship and you don't need antennas right well I got to thinking about it and I'm like just to be fun there's elements of dreads that I'm going to mimic on my spacesuit right why not 
So my space suit, my helmet is going to have the Wi-Fi antennas, and they're going to be the same antennas that she has, because that just makes sense, right? And then I'm doing um, lights that are part of the design, because if you're working outside in the dark in space, you need lights, and so there's going to be lights on the helmet. Well, on the third or fourth version of Dreads, she's got the lights built into her head because it actually was supposed to be she looks like she's wearing the helmet and her helmet is going to match my helmet only it's going to be a little bit different scale but there's common parts and so the ear antennas and the lights are going to just be the same part number we'll just say okay here plunk there's your lights and this came from one of the storylines that I was working on where as a person who used to work as a mechanic it is so annoying to not be able to see what you're doing you know I always worked with a flashlight somehow stuck to my hat so I could work with both hands without shining the light or you'd have your you know you drop light with you but then you're dragging the cord and it's getting tangled up and so I just always wanted to be able to have a light attached to my head somewhere and one day I was writing and we came up with the idea that I was going to put lights on, on the robot because the robot, in addition to helping me, would be close by, right? So she would be standing there handing me tools or I'd hand, you know, help her or she'd help me or whatever. And I'm like, wouldn't it just be the coolest thing ever if your robot had a flashlight mounted on its head? Because then it could shine the light for you. I'm like, well, duh. <laughs> you know, so... A lot of the stuff that we're building is going to be built, quote unquote, inside, and then we push it out through the airlock. So I'm not going to be wearing the helmet all the time. It did kind of make sense if the robot had lights on it, then it could shine the lights for me. There was a phrase that I wrote down somewhere and I just started laughing. Reality has no place in my universe. That works for me. But I still want things kind of based in a in a world that they would work. The Mars Clipper universe, I'll say. It could be it could end up being basically Elon Musk's SpaceX kind of a thing. When I first started writing Blue Moon, which is a kind of a prequel to Mars Clipper, I don't think I was even aware of Elon Musk and SpaceX. It was about 10 years ago when I started that one. 2008, 2009, something like that. I actually thought of it originally as possibly Virgin Galactic as being kind of a, a possible model company that could do something like this. But when I, you know, pretty much from the very first time I started writing, I was aware of a lot of things in the news that there really wasn't anything that I was trying to do with the exception of having a functioning robot. You know, so making a robot that could actually be your helper without somebody behind the scenes, you know, pulling the strings and making it work. The the artificial intelligence side of dreads, it's not super advanced you know it doesn't have the ability to to guess what you're thinking all the time and to do you know do everything but it's somewhere in that in that realm of alexis or google assistant kind of a thing where you ask a question and what makes it artificial intelligence is it doesn't it's not all knowing what it's doing is taking your question interpreting it comparing it to a list of, you know, a very long list of possible responses that somebody else has already programmed. And then over time, it's able to start to adapt better to what you're asking it. The same way that, you know, your smartphone, if you've asked your smartphone the similar question before, it'll kind of start guessing what you're trying to say. Sometimes it's completely wrong, but sometimes it gets kind of close. So, my thought was, aside from the massive amount of money it would take to do this, 
I wasn't really very far into science fiction. What I wanted to do was to show that it would be possible with what we have now. And one of the very first things I wrote down was on a post-it note, and I think it's around here somewhere. Every now and then I see it. Yeah, it's up on the ceiling actually, right above the camera. What I, I wrote down on the paper, it says Star Trek from shuttle to enterprise, moon and Mars, orbital something, something I can't really read it right now. But I wanted to kind of plot out a path of how did we get from the end of the space shuttle era to Star Trek, Enterprise, and beyond, right? So we had about a 500 year gap because Captain Kirk was supposed to be 500 years in the future. And then the last, I think it was the last one where they called it Star Trek Enterprise, that was before Captain Kirk, but still a ways in the future. And so I thought, what if we could show a way that we could go from where we are to Enterprise? and show that it's probably possible. And I started doing that in my mind before I was aware of Elon Musk and SpaceX. And yeah, I'm pretty sure in my lifetime, we're, we're definitely gonna see the ability to put people on Mars. If we actually do it or not is another question, but we're, we're not very far off. The other part of all of that, this idea because I can draw out ideas. So we got Earth and we got Mars. So it's not a straight line between them. You you know there's you know the sun is way out off camera somewhere and if we're seeing that we both orbit in the same direction you start from Earth when the Mars is behind you and then you kind of work your way out such that when you get there Mars arrives in the same part of space as you and roughly every 24 months everything is in the right spot the other times you're so far apart, you know, if, if, the, if, the, if the sun is in the middle, Earth is on one side, Mars is on the other side, you're not going to, that's not a good time to go. But every 24 months is an opportunity to get there. It's, it, things line up and it makes it easier. Up until now, it's been science. Well, science is cool and all, but science doesn't really pay the bills. There's no reason to go to Mars right now. You know, we, we can send rovers to Mars, and we've been doing that for a while. It's kind of fun when I think about it, because I was born in 67, and the first man on the moon, first man on the moon was in 1969. So pretty much the entire space industry has been in my lifetime. Now, we were doing space before we went to, before we put people on the moon, but it wasn't very much. You know, so all of this is going to happen in my lifetime, which is kind of fun. And we're already kind of to this, you know, we're like, oh, government is in charge, but it's not really. You know, so you got your government. But corporations and profit really drive everything. And so one of the things that I'm doing in Mars Clipper is that corporations are more powerful than government. And if a company comes up with an idea for putting a spaceship together that can go to the moon or to Mars and can do it on its own money, then you start to look at it as, well, even if a government didn't want you to go, there would become a point where the profit of a corporation 
can do something that a government can't do. And that's, that's exactly what SpaceX is in the position of right now, is they're able to do things that NASA can't even do. When you think about it, you know, they can do launches for cheaper because they're doing it from a, a business model of doing it for profit. You know, Elon Musk's whole idea of recycling and landing his rockets is the cost of if you looked at an airplane, and this is what was his words, the current way that we're doing space launches, rocket launches, if, if you look at an airplane, if at the end of every flight, if a plane crashed and you had to build a brand new airplane every time, how expensive would air travel be? It's enormous, right? So just by being able to land the airplane, put fuel in it, and fly it again, and proving that you could do that, and getting your cost down to the point that now you can buy a ticket to go to Vegas for, you know, 100 bucks, 150 bucks, whatever, it's not even a big deal. You know, you don't even put on nice clothes anymore. You know, you just show up in your jeans and your t-shirt, and you jump on the airplane, and you get there, and you're annoyed at the, everything on the airplane. It's no longer fun, it's just, it's this annoying thing that you have to do to get to where you're going, you know. The pictures you used to see from the 40s and 50s of people doing air travel, you know, they put on nice clothes and it was a big deal. You know, now it's just annoying. Well, by a company figuring out how to do rocket launches and get the cost down and make it affordable, he's able to turn a profit. Yeah, that's good, you know. You know, some people get all mad about rich people, but it's like, if you didn't have rich people, we wouldn't have anything. You wouldn't have railroads. Yeah, sure, you know, I was looking at this a while ago. When they built the railroads, the United States was a pretty young country, didn't really have the resources. There wasn't a tax base and there really wasn't a business model such that, you know, think about it, you know, a, a politician couldn't stand up in front of his people and say, we're going to raise your taxes so we can build a railroad. People would be like, well, screw that. We don't need a railroad. What the hell do we need a railroad for? But the government knew that if we had an ocean on this side and an ocean on this side and all this land in the middle, and most of the people lived over here still, and if they wanted to capitalize on this entire country, they needed to move these people over here. Because that's here's where all the resources were, right? So by, by having a railroad system across the country, they could get people back and forth very quickly. And then they could expand what was, you know, I don't know when the, when, when were the railroads? 1800s, right? So you were just, you know, most of the people were still on the East Coast. There wasn't hardly anybody over here. So they said, okay, we need railroads, but we can't afford railroads. But if we give land to these rich people and let them essentially create a government subsidized monopoly, they can create the railroads for us. And that's why your railroads are so powerful in this country is they had a, essentially an unfair advantage over everything else but in exchange now we have railroads where we maybe would never have had railroads otherwise okay so this was from u.s history class which was funny because i'm from canada but um See if I can draw this the way he did it on the on the board. If you look at a land plot, um, I don't I don't remember if they did a mile squares, you know. But if you look at how land is broken up into sections and ranges and so on, what uh, the teacher showed us is the government said, okay, we're going to give this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and imagine these are all the same size. 
will give this land to the railroads. Land around it is, is untouched, you know, but the railroad will own this land and they can turn around and sell that land to whoever they want and that money goes back in their pocket to help fund the railroad. And the railroad touched all of these X's all the way across. And they did this all the way across the country. All right. Which was great because, you know, it was like, well, the government didn't own the land either. They stole it from probably the Indians or somebody. But they're like, okay, so we're going to take the land and we're going to give it out. And, and you know, some of it was like, you know, and it was at the Oklahoma land rush, you know, where they said, okay, we're going to open up Oklahoma. Everybody, you know, everybody lines up here in a straight line and they shot a cannon. And at, at that time, everybody just goes trucking across. And you picked a spot you liked and you, st you know, put your flag in the ground and you said, that's yours. And then you went back and registered it. You know, they open up the whole country that way. You know, and here's all these Indians. They're like, what the hell? We didn't vote for this. So, yeah, go figure, right? Um, so by creating this, the railroads had enough money to then, to, you know. And here's the thing is, once you have a railroad, then they could start bringing stuff back and forth, and they created a need. Uh, there was a series of posters I remember seeing these in Canada all the time, places like national parks um, and lodges, you know, you'd see the old railroad lodges and so nobody would want to drive, you know, jump on a train and go all the way across the country. That sounds pretty awful. But in the Rocky Mountains in the middle, they built this beautiful lodge up in the Rockies, you know, somewhere. And that was a destination and they'd invite, you know, famous people or politicians or movie stars to go up there and have their picture taken and they'd stay for a week and they get to go see all of the fantastic countryside and then they'd put the pictures everywhere on the newspaper so then people you know stuck in the city were like oh gee that looks pretty cool and we could save up our money and we go on a rail trip and go across and see that and go back and so they started doing that all right so kind of keep that in mind what if We know that everything on Earth is also available throughout the solar system, even water. It's the basic elements, you know. Whatever was whatever was created on Earth is also, you know, there's asteroids out here somewhere past Mars that are the same building blocks that the whole solar system were made from. Plus Mars, plus everywhere else. Okay. So, let's say there was a corporation, doesn't matter, that had enough money to fund a mission to go from Earth to Mars and create trading posts halfway across. And then they would build a space station around Mars. I call it MOS. Mars Orbital Station. And then they could also send stuff down onto Mars and start mining. And if you look at SpaceX with their ability to land a rocket and to take off again, that actually is possible now. There is on NASA's website an enormous amount of publicly owned information basically. Anything that NASA has created or invented or whatever is essentially owned by the people, which is kind of cool. But they've talked about the materials for making rocket fuel. Part of the ingredients is available or can be converted directly from Mars atmosphere. That was in the movie The Martian. They talked about that. So there was a spaceship sitting on Mars before the people would get there. And it would sit there for two years with solar panels, and eventually it would create enough fuel to take off with. All right. So in, in the Martian, the idea was is you had this one ship that would go back and forth. They'd sit here and park in orbit, and then they'd take a little lander and land on the surface. And then next to where they landed was a ship that was already full of fuel, and they would use that to get off with, or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but the idea was that they could be making fuel 
from Mars atmosphere and there is science that says you can do that you need to take something with you but you don't have to take everything with you because like if you look at the space shuttle how big the main tanks used to be most of that was burned up before they got very far you know so if you had to take that much fuel with you to Mars it would take you 10 or 20 space shuttles just to get that amount of fuel off of Earth once it's in space it comes across pretty easy and then you land it you know and you hope it doesn't break like an egg when it hits the surface okay well if you can do mining on Mars or the asteroids the asteroids have the advantage because they don't have very much gravity and all the same materials are out there so they say there is asteroids that are made completely out of iron just a huge chunk of iron you know five miles across kind of a thing so if you could go over there and break off chunks of iron and have a solar powered smelter and create steel because there's also carbon out there or you could maybe find well, I mean if there's carbon now you can make carbon fiber house you know that's pretty cool so in the eventually you would get to a point that you could create a spaceship out here that had never been on earth and the hardest thing of space travel is getting off of earth in the first place so if you had a spaceship that had never even been on earth you could make it you know the size of an aircraft carrier or 10 times the size of an aircraft carrier now suddenly you've got you know like the love boat <laughs> you know you've got a freaking spaceship cruise line that could be going back and forth and I mentioned trading posts think about the rails you know going back and forth across the country if you had stopping points because it takes you 200 days to get from Earth to Mars plus or minus a month that's a long time I mean you go on a cruise ship you know 200 days that's like some of my cruises when I was in the Navy you know by the end of 200 days you're ready to get off you know you're not sure if you want to get back on again but what if you know every two months you'd get to one of these and you have an option to get off for a while you know maybe you'd, the ship would dock here you'd resupply and then you go on to the next one that kind of thing and then you're building ships based on the materials already in space or you're mining stuff from Mars so now you've got a reason you know if you can show that it's possible you come back to earth and you start putting up ads hey you know we're looking for people to to go off world and and mine well you're sitting here flipping burgers for minimum wage and you're like man you can make a hundred thousand dollars a year that would be great you know, there's people that'll do that they don't care you know and you think about you know some of your I mean people in places like the Philippines you'll get one person that gets educated they'll go to the Americas work like you know work really hard and send 99 percent of their money back to support their family all right so you could have that same mentality you get a guy that you know guy or girl somebody goes to Mars works for four years because it takes you 24 months to get there so you're not gonna or 20 months every 24 months it lines up right so you got you know you get there the spaceship leaves everything goes out of alignment 24 months later is your first opportunity to leave because it's too far otherwise you'd be out there forever maybe you get a contract you know work on Mars for 24 months at the end of 24 months we'll give you a hundred thousand dollar signing bonus if you stay for another 24 months because it costs a fortune to get you there but if you're able to mine on Mars, Mars has way less gravity than the Earth. So you could build a spaceship on Mars and get it into Mars orbit a lot easier than you can get one off of Earth. Okay. So we could have space tourism. There's people that would pay for that. You know. You could have an industry on Mars 
once you have people on Mars, then it becomes like the Wild West. If you've got an industry on Mars, or think about every mining town, you know, that mining town needs a couple doctors, some nurses, um, shopkeepers, you're going to need a Starbucks, you're going to need a Walmart, you know, you're going to need all these other things. And so you're going to have people working in all the little shops to support the miners, you know, and you think about places like, you know, the, where the oil is, you know, people are making enormous money, you know, and they'll be throwing $5 tips for a cup of coffee because it's not a big deal. All right. So now you've got a whole sub industry supporting the miners. You need to be able to grow food because it's going to take you 24 months to get the food out there, or once every 24 months. So you got to have your own way of growing food. That's kind of a fun side note. Plants need carbon dioxide, and they release, and they release oxygen. Mars atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide. It's very thin, but you could pump Mars atmosphere into an inflated greenhouse on the surface, you'd have solar, you'd have a greenhouse, and you'd have all that leftover carbon dioxide. The plants would be releasing oxygen. You pump that into your mind, or your habitat, or wherever your people are. That happens automatically, plus you're growing food accidentally. You know, that's kind of fun. When I look at all this, it's a story just ripe for the picking. You know, and you know, it's like, Obviously, Earth and Mars are real places. This isn't really science fiction. The only real fiction is the money. But as soon as one person figures out that they can go to Mars and create a business model for it, there's going to be other people jumping up because as soon as one guy turns a profit, now you got competition. Other guys are going to pop up, you know. And there's going to be governments trying to get into it, but they're about, you know, 20 years behind. And as the economy tanks, this is going to be less and less of an issue. And then you're going to have little privateers popping up. You know, they're going to have their little spaceships. And then you're going to have, you know, space pirates. Because that's inevitable. That's about four or five seasons in. But space pirates and zombies because, you know, radiation. Didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> yeah. All right, I got to go build a robot. Well, that's about it. Thank you so much for watching. Yeah, that should work. Cool. I do things differently. Oh, and please, if you like any of this, it would be really awesome if you could subscribe and click that notify bell. Drop a comment if you have any questions or ideas. Share, like, comment, subscribe, notify. Oh, and Patreon if you're really an awesome kind of person. Thank you so much for watching.